Welcome to Hope for Better Times, the Pietist Option for Lutherans, a four-part online series. I'm your host, Chris Gerritz. I'm a history professor at Bethel University in Arden Hills, Minnesota. And more importantly for this talk, at least its original audience, I'm a member of Roseville Lutheran Church in Roseville, Minnesota. Uh, we're pretty new members of RLC. We joined about last year. If you've seen me at all, it's probably up in the choir loft. Uh, here I am. I'm the six foot three guy standing in between Kevin and Dorothy most Sundays. Uh, if that's a little too far away, I'll show you a closer picture. This actually was up at the church Facebook page not long ago, so I'm not sure who took it, but that's uh, me singing with my wife Katie and our twins Lena and Isaiah. So we're still getting to know people, mostly for me that's in the choir and then in Cornerstone and some of the other kids activities. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. I'm from the Twin Cities originally, and grew up mostly in Stillwater. Uh, I graduated from Mounds Park Academy over in Maplewood and then went out east for my education. I went to the College of William & Mary for college. I was a history major and then I got my history PhD at Yale University in 2002. I came back to Minnesota in 2003 to take a job at Bethel University or Bethel College back then. And I'm now in what I think is my 17th year at Bethel where mostly I teach 20th century history. I'm actually writing a spiritual biography of Charles Lindbergh right now. And I teach classes on things like modern European history, uh, military and diplomatic history. I've got a Cold War class next fall, World War II class next spring. Uh, I teach a sports history class right now, but I also research and occasionally teach a little bit about something called pietism as part of uh, some other um, uh, church history things that I teach and write about. So I'll say a little bit more about pietism at the end of this segment and then a lot more in segment two and following. But I thought I should step back from our specific topic and ask, uh, I think, a more pressing, bigger question that, that's fair to ask. Should we even be spending our time on something like this? After all, I think we all know we've got bigger fish to fry right now. We've, we've got this vir virus you see pictured here, and we're dealing with this uh, flattening the curve issue that you probably have seen pictured in a graph like this before. It, I think it's fair to ask, shouldn't we be concerned with other things besides church history? How important can that possibly be when we're worried about the future? You know, when uh, everything is thrown into upheaval? How much time should we spend in the past when we're just trying to live day by day and thinking about the near future? At the same time, I think I've already seen some evidence that this is causing us to turn back to the past in some ways. That it's causing all of us to become at least a certain kind of historian. For example, when you deal with something as unprecedented as this COVID-19 is for most of us, it's tempting to look for historical analogies. And uh, in our nation's history, at least, uh, unfortunately, the best one is the 1918 influenza pandemic that's sometimes called the Spanish flu. Actually started probably here in Kansas, but Spain was neutral during World War I, so it was called the Spanish flu. A couple of weeks ago, before this really escalated, but as it was becoming clear the churches might have some tough choices to make, schools, etc., I went back to newspapers from the fall of 1918 when public authorities closed churches, schools, theaters, restaurants, you know, much like what we've seen recently with shelter-in-place orders, social distancing initiatives, quarantining. And I was curious, how did Christians respond back in 1918? And it turns out it's very similar to how they're responding here in 2020. Uh, largely a kind of resigned acceptance. You know, this is necessary as an emergency. People didn't like it, but they did it. But uh, others were defiant. They continued to meet. They dared the police to arrest them. And then others used as a spur to be creative. They tried to think about how to do church differently when they couldn't meet in a sanctuary on a Sunday morning. And probably most importantly, Christians responded as I guess I had hoped they would. Uh, they prayed and they served their neighbor. Some of them risked their lives. And uh, certainly we can see those parallels here in 2020. I'm not sure that history really repeats, but as a poet once said, history rhymes. And we're hearing a lot of rhyming right now. So in that sense, like that, po that blog post I wrote about the Spanish flu has been viewed like 20, 25,000 times at this point. There's clearly interest in that kind of history. And there's even some Christian history that I think uh, followers of Jesus Christ ought to be looking to. For example, in 1527, the bubonic plague showed up again. Uh, of course, the Black Death was the middle of the 1300s, but even 200 years later, it was showing up every 10 to 25 years in most European cities, including a German town called Wittenberg. 
right? It's the middle of the Protestant Reformation, six years after the Diet of Worms, 10 years after the 95 Theses. Martin Luther is starting to raise a family. He's had one child. He's about to have a second who does not survive the plague. And he's a professor and a, and a pastor. Now, most of the people in Wittenberg flee the plague, uh, which makes perfect sense. It's deadly. People don't always have immunity to it. And at least in that year of 1527, the local ruler ordered people to leave. Specifically, the professors and students of Wittenberg's university had to go to the University of Jena. But Luther refused to go. He stayed in place, he taught, he preached, he ministered to the sick, and he wrote a letter to another pastor who asked him whether Christians should flee a plague. And my guess is some of you have already read that letter or seen quotations from it on social media because it's quite a thoughtful pastoral piece of writing. It's, it's nuanced. There's no clear answer. Uh, Luther didn't think that you had to stay and risk your life. In fact, it was better to do things to preserve health unless you had a certain calling. It was different if you were a doctor. It was different if you were a political authority who had responsibility to face difficult decisions and not to shy away from the truth. And so I'm actually been quite glad to see that going around, um, both because of its specific words about a public health crisis, but also because it helps us, you know, as Lutherans or as Christians more generally, think about our calling. You know, we've heard a lot about that actually in the Lenten series that uh, we've that we've been doing on Wednesday nights. What does it mean to have a calling from God? And for Luther, it chiefly goes back to service to your neighbor, to love of your neighbor. And your calling is particular. We don't all have the same calling. We have different gifts. We have uh, different experiences, different abilities, and it's multiple. I'm very conscious right now that I'm not just a professor. I'm not just a teacher or a writer. I'm a parent. I need to help my kids and my wife cope with all these changes as well. And that was part of Luther's idea of calling as it's tested in the middle of, uh, of a plague. And so I think that this one especially, this case of Luther's 1527 letter, points to some of the value of studying history in a crisis for all people, but um, certainly for Christians. And, and really, that's the, all I really want to do in this first segment, is to try to convince you that it's worth your while to spend, you know, we'll probably do like 50 or 60 minutes on this, studying history in the middle of a crisis. Now, you're already listening, so maybe I didn't have to work too hard to convince you, but uh, if you've got friends and neighbors and families who maybe wouldn't have given a second look at this, uh, tell them that it's worth maybe listening to this and, and seeing if they can learn something. There is something educational about a crisis. It helps you realize who you are when you strip away things you're used to and you get to the essence of something. Much as we want to be a community united by grace that meets together in person, when we can't do that, we have to ask, what is the church? It's, it's not just a building. It's not just a Sunday morning hour together. The church exists outside of that time. And that's uh, being clarified for us right now. We're being forced to ask who we are in terms of who do we need to become. But crises can be dangerous because in the, for the sake of adapting to change, you can forget who you've been. And you can't really understand who you are without knowing who you've been. And so I think we also need to dig into our roots to get some sense of where identity lies, what our values are, what our mission is, where they come from, why they're distinct. And, you know, I would have said the same thing if COVID had never been a thing. And if this was Palm Sunday and we were meeting in the little adult ed classroom and you were sitting there and I was looking at you face to face, because I was going to talk about a different kind of crisis as a reason to study the history that I'll be presenting. So let me show you a different graph with a very different curve. This comes from the ELCA Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. And it was presented by a Luther Seminary professor administrator named, I think it's Dwight Sheely, in a blog post back in September and then in other presentations. So using different kinds of data, the ELCA office and Sheely had projected that by the year 2041, average weekly worship attendance in all ELCA congregations put together would drop down to under 16,000 people. From right now, it's just under 900,000 people. And in some ways, it's even worse if you look at baptized membership. In 2017, the ELCA had just under 3.5 million baptized members. Uh, the research office projects that by mid-century, it'll be less than 70,000. If nothing changes, the ELCA will functionally disappear um, within my lifetime, certainly within the lifetime of my kids. Now, of course, things will change. That's the nature of what we are like as humans. The churches will adapt and they'll innovate and there'll be external kinds of changes. There can be revival. That's part of the Christian story too. 
But there is a kind of slow brewing significant crisis facing churches like RLC and its neighbors in the ELCA and local synods. Now, I thought about this because Pastor Olson preached about this in the middle of Advent last December. And of course, one of his responses was absolutely right, which is that the ELCA can go away and the kingdom of God will still prevail. That's totally true. But I think this should trouble us, right? I mean, we, we think there's something important about being part of this community united by grace. There's something important about being in worship and being formed by Christian education um, and how that then spills out into how we treat each other. And so in the midst of that crisis and then the midst of this other public health crisis, it's a good time, I think, for Lutherans to dig into their past. There are a lot of resources there, not just Martin Luther, but what comes after Luther. And that includes a movement known as pietism. So this is a kind of move I'm pretty familiar with making. I've spent a lot of my time at Bethel since I arrived there talking about why pietism matters to that school. So Bethel started its life as a Swedish Baptist immigrant seminary in Chicago in 1871. And by 1914, it had moved for good to St. Paul, across from the fairgrounds, and then up to Arden Hills in the 70s, and became a university along the way. So Swedish Baptists are an interesting group. They, they really start in the 1840s, as a minority within the population of Sweden that ends up breaking away from the state Lutheran church. For a variety of reasons, they come to believe that infants shouldn't be baptized, which leads them to be ostracized and even persecuted to some degree. Many of them then flee to the United States where they found churches and eventually they need to train pastors. So they set up a seminary, which again becomes the university I work at. But the, the way they got to the position they held in baptism was through the revival of something called pietism in 1840s Scandinavia. And so it shaped them. Uh, Bethel is a Baptist institution, but when I first got there, I remember thinking, this is not like the Baptists I've known. It's not like the Southern and the Independent and the Fundamentalist and the Reform Baptists that I'd encountered in places like Virginia and Georgia and Connecticut. It was different. There was a different ethos. And... I learned to recognize that it had to do with pietism. It reshaped Baptist churches, just like it reshaped Lutheran and Mennonite and Reformed and other churches. And so I helped edit a book about that in 2015 with some colleagues from Bethel. And then two years after that, University Press also published a book I did with a friend and former pastor named Mark Patty. Mark's the senior pastor of Salem Covenant Church up in New Brighton, which is where we worship for about 15 years before coming to RLC. And so our idea was to write a pretty slender book. It's about 120 pages called The Pietist Option, Hope for the Renewal of Christianity. And I'll say more about where its structure comes from. It actually borrows an outline from a 1675 book by a German Lutheran pastor. But it really wasn't meant to be a history book. We wanted to draw on different parts of pietist history in order to speak into the present, to give some relatively concrete applicable advice to individuals in churches here in the 21st century about how we can seek renewal. The LCA is not the only one going through numerical decline. And even denominations that aren't suffering that kind of decline are suffering other kinds of decline. But pietism is a movement that has always been hopeful. The title for the series, Hope for Better Times, is an old, old pietist slogan. And to understand why it's so meaningful, you have to understand that the first pietists we're living in the ruins of warfare. We're worried because COVID might kill one, two, three percent of the population. The first pietists had survived the Thirty Years' War, which killed 20 to 30 percent of the German population, and yet they insisted that there was hope for better times. They insisted that God is a God of grace, but that grace is transforming. It changes individuals and churches and the world itself. And so I've always found it a pretty powerful story, and maybe all the more so when we're living through a crisis right now. So that's my goal for this series. Uh, in part two, we'll talk about what pietism is, how it's been understood, misunderstood, and what's caused the, the, the two. And then part three, we'll make the connection to Lutheranism. I'll tell the pietist story and how it's showed up in everything from those original German Lutheran churches to Scandinavia to the United States. And then part four, we'll close with some specific advice. What, what would this mean for Lutherans, Lutheran churches, and other Christians here in the 21st century? So if you ever have questions or concerns, you can certainly email me at the Bethel address you see on the screen. You can read more from me at my personal blog, pietoschoolman.com, or you can look up The Anxious Bench on Patheos. 
I'll also include some specific links to books and articles from me and from other authors on the YouTube page for each of these segments. So until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.